Hi everyone, and welcome to another Radults Bite, a short form version of the Radults podcast that's published outside of our usual schedule to take the edge off your hunger for more inspiration. Today's guest is vocalist Jordan Dreyer of American post hardcore band La Dispute. La Dispute will be returning to Australian shores for their first run of headline dates in over five years this September as they play a whopping 15 shows across the nation. The tour is happening in support of their fantastic record, Panorama, released in March and has been getting nothing but positive accolades worldwide since. Jordan is a certified Radolt and such a positive and inspiring guy and it was an absolute blast beat to have the opportunity to speak with him on Radolts. Jordan Dreyer of La Dispute, thanks for joining us on the Radolts podcast. Of course, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Jordan, we're a multidisciplinary arts and inspiration podcast. So for the benefits of those listeners who might not be all post-hardcore like I am, who are you and what do you do? Oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> my, you said my name. My name's Jordan Dreyer. Uh, I sing in a band called La Dispute. That is originally from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and is now spread out across the globe. It must be a pretty wonderful feeling uh, having something that you started in Grand Rapids, Michigan, be able to be playing all around the globe. Can you shed a little light on what it feels like to have achieved your creative dream? Oh, man. Um, it is never not incredibly humbling uh, when you decide at, you know, at the time in your life that we decided that we were passionate about uh, making music. You don't really look far enough ahead to consider the potential possibilities. It just kind of happens incrementally. Um, sometimes you have to stop and look back and consider the progress to really appreciate it. Cause it is a remarkable thing to have the opportunity to do what you love with your friends, but to be able to do it in a capacity that is self-sustaining and that can bring you to the other side of the globe is a really, really incredible thing. We're very fortunate. Um, yeah, still very, I feel like I'm forever processing it, to be honest with you. That's completely understandable. I mean, it, it sounds like an absolute dream. Now, uh, your new record, Panorama, is awesome. Um, now that you're a few tours and a, and a few months past the release, how are you feeling about it personally? Uh, thank you, first off. Uh, I think we all feel very good about it. It's a strange thing. Um, I don't know, just like you at the outset, when you have the, the creative impulse and the idea and you start to work on things, um, it's, you, you, you're so fully immersed in what you do that it's difficult to really examine it externally. Um, and because you have all your, you know, like obstacles to overcome and tasks to accomplish and really, it's a weird thing where it's the most fun and most satisfying thing, but it's also absolute hell. Uh, and then you finish, right? And then you, you can like finally stop thinking about it and tinkering incessantly with every word and every note. Um, but then you want nothing to do with it for a while. You're not really like going to sit down and listen to the record right away. Uh, and then by the time you're ready to do that, you have to start to figure out how to play the song in a live environment. So then you basically start over with a new thing. Uh, and then eventually... <laughs> you hit like a stride where it becomes second nature and you start to have fun again. And, uh, I think we're like really at the point now where we can step back and appreciate the thing that we did together. Uh, laugh about the times where it was really difficult and be thankful for the opportunity to give it to people and to, it must be really cool having these, uh, oh, that's fine. That's fine. Rambling is exactly what podcasts were invented for. <laughs> <laughs> True. Now, um, has the, has the record connected with listeners the way that you thought it would, or are the songs that have connected with people most different to the ones you anticipated? <laughs> hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I, mean, I think this is, we joke about this, uh, fairly often where every time we make a new record, we think that, uh, it's, it's, it's the one that's too different from the one that preceded it for people to enjoy. And that we're going to like alienate 
whole swaths of the people who have listened and been loyal to us over the years, which is a really silly thing to think. It, it, I think sells people incredibly short, but I guess it comes from a place where you're anxious about, uh, you know, about giving something to everyone. Um, so it's been cool again, where we had that thought while we were writing that maybe people wouldn't connect with it the way that they did the records we've done previously. And it didn't take long for us to realize how silly that was. And people have really, uh, gravitated towards it and I think appreciated it for its differences. And I think, yeah, there, I mean, we like, you're pretty, you're pretty certain of which songs are going to have the most like emotional impact generally the ones that have you know, a powerful emotional climax or parts that are uh, suitable for singing along. Um, and then I think for us, that was probably, we just assumed that that was going to be the first track on the record, uh, the first full proper track, full street one. Um, and I feel like the one that people have connected to the most is the second to last track. Uh, there you are, which is like the one that probably sounds the most, uh, I hesitate to say poppy, stronger vocal melodies in a, in a more de defined chorus, which we don't generally do and which we, I think only do in that place on the record. Um, maybe one other. So that one kind of surprised me. Um, which is cool. It's cool to be surprised. It's cool when you, write a song that you feel like might be too far adrift from the center, and that's the one that people maybe uh, appreciate the most. Yeah, you touched on an interesting point there, because I would say that your lyrical and vocal stylings are a massive part of the soundscape of La Dispute. Um, how did your style evolve, and do you think it's important for vocalists to find that distinctive tone in the way that you have? Um, yeah, I... I, so when we started making music, we were very young, um, the earliest infancy, like the earliest our band existed, I was still in high school, I was like 16, um, and I more or less conned my cousin Brad, who plays drums in our band, into thinking I could be some sort of lead vocalist in the band, <laughs> He's always been very musically inclined, and uh, I always wanted to be very musically inclined because of a, you know, like a deep seated passion for punk rock, and especially in the formative years. Uh -huh. So when we first started making music, when I completed that con, uh, I didn't really know what I was going to do, so um, I guess I, it, like, you walk up to the microphone, and you see what happens, and I couldn't sing, but I could speak, and a lot of the vocalists that I loved at that time had, you know, a, a similar foundation to their style, so um, the beginning was kind of an accident, and then, and then you do it all the time, right? Like, I think that's most, for me... Uh, that I have learned and the most that I have evolved were not making new music so much as touring for all the years that we did and settling into what worked and finding my own voice. Um, so uh, it was, a, I think, a pretty gradual process and a, a constant process still to this day. Everything that I've done, I like to think has changed in some capacity and pushes me not closer to a final style, but pushes me away from my comfort zone and challenges me. Uh, and I don't know. I think that, yeah, I think, I think it took me a long time. And, um, but I think, yeah, it's, I mean, you can have heroes and you can have reference points, but I, I do think that, um, just like when you're writing, you want to find your own voice. I think it's, it's really uh, revelatory when you get to the point where you know that you're speaking from yourself, I guess, if that makes any sense whatsoever. 
No, yeah, that answer makes makes complete sense. And I, I do wonder, given that you were a writer first and foremost before you started uh, trying to be a singer, if you now have you now feel that you found the right outlet for your for your writing. Do you think you found the medium through which it's best uh, expressed? I mean, I was never really a writer. I was <laughs> in high school when you started, so um, that's what I loved to do then, but it wasn't in any uh, even amateur capacity. It was a hobby. Uh, I, I think that I have found the one thing that I am currently adept at <laughs> with my writing. Uh, you know, like, I think it took me a long time. Well, it took me a long time to be like, to even feel comfortable saying I am a, an artist or a musician. Um, I, I don't, and I don't think that, I think I would have to learn and then master another discipline altogether to feel comfortable calling myself a writer. So, um, I don't know. I think, I think it's not just, not the, I mean, it, it is the best medium for what I do because it's the only thing <laughs> that I do and the only thing that I know how to do. Uh, and I'm, I just, it took me a while to like, I don't know, I think it feels sometimes it's difficult to, uh, feel comfortable plotting yourself in any specific role, especially when you have other passions and ambitions. But, uh, I'm 31. I'll be 32 in a week's time, less than that. And I'm like finally really at the point where I feel not just like comfortable saying I am what I am, but proud of it. And I think that what I am is a uh, lyricist and a vocalist for a lot of people. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty amazing and impressive thing to be. Um, now, I am... <laughs> I'm the only one who is that. Exactly. You're, you're truly unique. You're the only person in the world that can answer that question on the airport form that way. <laughs> now, uh, I am, I am a little interested, um, to know what has inspired you to come to Australia for 15 shows. That's a lot more than what people generally head out here for. <laughs> oh man. Uh, we've, uh, we have a long history in Australia. First, where we ever did outside of North America was in Australia. We were, very young for a few years we came pretty much annually some of our very best friends in the world people who have flown all over the country to work with us and travel with us uh there's people that we've met on tours in australia in the first couple tours we did it wasn't well the first i don't know first or four tours we did it wasn't just come to the capital you know not not or even probably what most fans do in Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane. Um, I've always wanted to come and play more places and meet more people and give more people the opportunity to come and see us. So we took five years off and we came back last year, year and a half, I can't remember, for a good thing festival. Um, and it was really fun and the shows were really amazing. But I think uh, just further cemented that we needed to come back in a in a stronger capacity and to spend more time here uh, because we love it so much and because people in Australia have always been such a big part of our band and our band's history and our band whatever success I guess so um, I don't know just wanted to come and not sell the experience short and give as many people as possible the opportunity to come see us. I was just going to say, it's as much a selfish thing as anything. Like, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a transaction. It's not like, you know, we're doing it exclusively because we feel, you know, we have an obligation to do it. We're doing it because it's really fun for us because we have a strong connection to the country and to so many different locations in said country. And we'd do more if we had the time, honestly. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's for us, too, because we get a lot out of it. That's awesome. I, I'm really looking forward to the tour personally. I'm even going to make a trip down to my uh, my childhood home of Frankston because just the idea of Love Dispute playing in Frankston kind of blows my mind a bit, so I'm going to have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That's so sick. I love it. 
Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, I've just got a couple of quick things before I let you go, because I know you've got a day that you probably want to get on with. Um, now, the purpose of this podcast is to inspire and empower other people to pursue their creative dreams. Um, so, as a person who turned their creative vision into reality, do you have any advice or, or tips for other people on how they can pursue theirs? Oh, man. Uh, you know, I think, uh, I think that one of the most important things for our success was uh, the, the friends we made along the way, the people who invested their time in us. Uh, and I think that the, the most important thing about building strong relationships is making certain that you are also doing your part to lift other people up. Um, so coming from the Midwest and the U.S. in uh, basements and DIY spaces, um, the, that sense of camaraderie is what laid the foundation for us to have the opportunity to continue doing it all these years later. So I think a big part is, is just doing what you can for your community to lift others up. Um, people will do the same for you if you invest in them. Um, and I don't even just mean on like a, a, a musical level or like in reference to this, this theme, you know, like do what you can for the people you love and they'll, they'll back you it's hard or harder. Um, and just not like, I don't know, it's not super fucking obvious and corny to say don't, no compromises, but, but truly, um, I think if you're able to channel your passion into what you do, you're able to feel sound ethically about having done so, you avoid stagnating, you keep yourself challenged creatively, you keep yourself enthusiastic about what you're doing. And I think it's so important to just always love what you're doing if you want to make it work. Um, so, I don't know. That's a few answers. But I think if you're passionate and honest about what you're doing and you're supportive of the people in your community, uh, you give yourself a really good opportunity to succeed at least. Those are all really good tips. I, I would I would call those tips for being a rat alt, which is what we have decided to call all of you people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, because you are rad adults. <laughs> I love it. Um, now, just just a couple of quick ones uh, before you go. Um, the first the first is uh, you spend a lot of time in Lotus Butte making sure that you push uh, positive messages through your music and also spend time in making sure you're playing all ages shows in order to get those messages out to a younger generation. Um, what is it that drives that? Um, do you think that's central to your band's identity? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I think that punk, rock, hardcore, whatever... Uh, whatever you want to call it. I think part of what makes it uh, a, a strong and unique community is that it, when practiced properly, opens the door for people, for, you know, for everyone, for uh, people without exceptions. And I think it's one small way that we can illustrate that uh, principle to play shows that aren't age-restricted where possible um, so that everybody has the opportunity to come out. Uh, it's a bit difficult sometimes. It's truthfully harder in Australia, I think, than really anywhere. Um, but we have really good people behind us who put the extra effort into making that happen um, so that everyone has the opportunity to come out and to be in a place that they feel safe and able to thrive. And that includes people who aren't of age to drink, you know? Absolutely. I remember going to shows, um, the, the rare ones that would happen when I was younger. Um, and it made such a monumental difference to my own, my own experience of growing up in a, in a suburban community. Um, and my own, my own, and it really opened my world up. Um, so I think it's great that bands are still out there trying to do it. 
just awesome. Yeah, same for me. I mean, having the, the venues that I did in downtown Grand Rapids to go to when I was a kid, uh, I don't know that I would have found the community that I did at that time had I not been able to go to the arts cooperative or go to the coffee shop to see a band play. So I think it's super important. It is. Now, I'm going to let you go, but uh, if I'll give you a couple of seconds to uh, to tell people if they are interested now, having listened to the to the interview, where could they find uh, La Dispute, and where would be the best place to start? Oh, uh, I would start with our most recent record, Panorama, uh, and you can listen to that literally anywhere I think that music exists. <laughs> pick your pick your poison. Solid advice. <laughs> now, thanks for taking the time to talk to talk with us on Radults, Jordan. Um, it's been an inspiring chat, and I'd love to get you on for a full length episode sometime down the line. So uh, maybe I can have a chat to you when you're down under. Yeah, for sure. Come say hi. Uh, keep the ball rolling. I appreciate you having me on. Speaking with you is really fun. Butterspeed's Australian tour kicks off on Thursday, the fifth of September, at the Amplifier Bar in Perth. Followed by stops in Fremantle, Adelaide, Geelong, Belgrave, Melbourne, Frankston, Sydney, Canberra, Wollongong, Newcastle, Brisbane, and the Gold Coast before closing out at Soul Bar on the Sunshine Coast on the 22nd of September. Details and tickets for all dates are available now via destroyalllines.com. We thank you for joining us today for this Rudolph's Bite. And if you enjoyed what you heard today, we encourage you to follow, like, rate, and share our content. Then go out there and live life a little more rattled.